affected by the love of things and the love of money a little bit too much. So we have to combat that love. So now we consider the, the second meditation, the three classes of men, page 77. Meditations go back to back. Even on the 30-day retreat, they go back to back. Many of the other meditations uh, you know, are spread out over many days on a 30-day retreat. <coughs> but this particular one, is on the fourth day of the second week, it must be done the same day. And here I see it on the bottom of page 77, the three classes of men. On the same fourth day, a meditation on the three classes of men is to be made, do we might embrace which is best. This is a corollary of the two standards. Two standards, three classes of men go back to back. They go hand in hand. And what we're considering primarily is the negative side of the two standards, that the devil is using the love of riches as the primary bullet, the primary weapon to destroy our souls. So we have to definitely fight against that love of riches. What do we remember? What do we notice? What are our gifts? And, uh, you know, these are very important to win the battle against this, or try fight to win the battle against this lust for riches, and recognize we do have a serious problem with it. And when we come out of the meditation realizing, I do spend too much time thinking about things. I do spend too much of my time worrying about the budget. I do spend too much of my time worrying about finances. Too many of my fights, too many of my difficulties, such as the fights with the wife and so on, are related in some way to money. It is a challenge for me. And what happens? A sudden donation. 10,000 ducats. Mm -hmm. Here is a parable of St. Ignatius. Here is to consider three classes of men. Each of them has acquired 10,000 ducats. But not purely as they should have for the love of God. These men all <coughs> wish to save their souls and find peace in God our Lord by freeing themselves of the serious impediment arising from their attachment to this acquired money. So they've received 10,000 ducats, a large sum of money, suddenly and legitimately. So they got 10,000 ducats quickly, and they got 10,000 ducats legitimately. So the, the, um, the, the problem is, they just made the meditation of the two standards, and they recognize that even this legitimate money is so dangerous because it can drag their soul down. Very dangerous. And the love of this legitimate money endangers the salvation of their souls. So they're worried about it. Three possibilities. Note concerning this parable of St. Ignatius. All three men are the friends of God. All three men made the meditation of the call of Christ the King. All three men made the meditation of the two standards. All three <coughs> men recognize they have a problem. And all three men realize the need to overcome it. This is an advanced man. These three men are advanced, so to speak. They're at a certain level of the battle. They have left, they made the good general confession. They've entered the army of Christ. They've made many, many steps. And yet they realize that we have a serious problem. <coughs> and that is the attachment arising to this 10,000 ducats. Now remember, if the 10,000 ducats, this large sum of money, was received illegitimately, then of course they will be obliged under pain of mortal sin to return it. That will be a mortal sin obligation. So that's not that's not what we're dealing with. You won the lottery, you know, a, a rich uncle died and uh, left you, uh, you know, his uh, sled named Rosebud. Uh, you know, somehow you just simply acquired a lot of money legitimately. Obviously, if it's illegitimate, you have to return it. So we're not, remember, only legitimate. We're dealing with legitimate. Notice in this meditation also, we're not going to be dealing with sin. <clears throat> and yet there's a worry. There's a worry. And there should be. And why is that? Because remember, no matter how holy you are, no matter how close you are to God, the devil's always trying to pull away. The devil's always trying to drag us away from God. So we better be careful. We better be worried. <coughs> and so, what about these three classes? So here will be to beg the grace to choose what is for the greatest glory of His divine majesty and the salvation of my soul. So, what are we going to do? 
three classes, three possible reactions. Number one is the, the first class of man equals I would <coughs> like. The I would like class. This is called Veletas. Second class, I want. This is also a problem. And the third class is the one that we want to be. First class, I would like. Boulet talks. Notice what St. Ignatius says. They would like to free themselves, the first class, of the attachment that they have for the acquired money acquired in order to find peace in God our Lord and to be able to save their souls but up to the hour of death they do not take the means up to the hour of death they do not take the means <clears throat> this is the most common class to make life a little bit more complicated we can be of the first class in some areas and of the second class in others we can be in both classes what we consider here the first class. I would like to be, it's called Valetas. Valetas, or Valeity is an English word, an old, I guess an old English word to be taken from the Latin. A Valeity, a wish, I guess you could say. <sighs> the trouble of this Valetas is that we don't understand what it means. I would like. What does that mean? Here is the literal meaning of it. I would like means... No, not now. We believe it means yes, but it doesn't mean yes. You know that I remember, you know, when uh, many times I listen to mommy on the phone, somebody calls over, you know, why don't you uh, leave your kids and we'll go shopping and blah, blah, blah. And of course, Mommy hates the other lady, does not want to go with her, can't stand being a swither for one second. What does he say? Are you kidding me? I'll die first. Goodbye. <laughs> no. What does he say? I would like to go. Mm -hmm. I so would love to be with you, but I am tied up. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Bye. <laughs> I would like. The trouble with this I would like, it's a very serious trouble. The reason why it's a very serious trouble is because it's a form of a lie, really. And the reason why it's a serious trouble is because we're lying to ourselves. When you lie to someone else, you can always repent. Tomorrow not tell the lie. But when you lie to yourself, you're, you're, you're up the creek. What are you going to do? Eventually... The great punishment of the liar, says St. Gregory the Great, is that he is cursed by one day believing his own lies. So that he can no longer distinguish between lie and truth. And he'll lie where there's no reason. So, it literally means no, not now. See, the word no, there's another meaning. No, not now. There's another possibility, to put in brackets up here, which means no, not ever. This is a, the first one, no, not ever, is what we call an absolute no. This is an absolute no. No, not now is a relative no. We're into philosophy here. A relative no. In other words, I'm saying no to you at this moment, but if things were different, I would say yes. For instance, is there room for St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin in the end? No. Why? Because they don't have enough money. But if they were multimillionaires, and if the kinkeeper knew that it was a son of God being born, he would have found room. The no would have been transformed into a yes. However, if the innkeeper was Satan, the no would never be transferred to a yes. The no would always be absolute. No, not ever. Because he hates Christ. And he hates all goodness. 
But the average innkeeper says no simply because, I'm sorry, but given our rules and regulations, given the situation of the world today, given the fact that, the, that, that you don't have enough money, you're not able to stay here. Most of our no's in life are relative no's. They're not usually, or not very often, absolute no's. Even we say, under no circumstances am I going to give you this book. Here's a hundred thousand bucks. You want to take it now, or do you want, to, do you want me to wrap it? Do you want me to mail it to you? <coughs> How do you want me to take, give it to you? So, your no is really absolute until the right conditions are present. So, absolute no's are actually very rare things. And even when we say no and never, we're usually lying. Normally. Or at least... Not telling the truth, even if we're not intentionally lying. The most common no in a man's life is a relative no. A no that is not in these present circumstances, but change the circumstances, and we might change our answer. So the one we're dealing with here in the this first class is the relative no, no, not now. But it doesn't <coughs> say the word no, and that's why St. Ignatius says, up to the hour of death, they do not take the means. It is a mystery, because we would think that, you know, the easy example of Valetas, I would like, I would like to lose weight. I really wouldn't. I would like to lose weight. Now, what do you do when you want to lose weight? The I would like class, it's, it, we could also call it the New Year's resolution. What's a New Year's resolution? It's a resolution to do something you know you're never going to do. Ever. But it's not proper to tell people that you're never going to do that, so you make a resolution about it. It's also called an Indian promise. Indian promises are awesome. My father Chazelle says, you know, what is an Indian promise? He says that what matters is how you feel the moment they make the promise. I'm going to be there. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to be with you the whole time. I'm behind you the whole way. How did you feel when you made that promise? You felt good, right? Well, okay. So what are you worried about? The fact that it never fulfilled the promise was irrelevant. It matters is how you feel at the moment the promise is made. That's an Indian promise. So, the fact is that I would like to lose weight. I really would. Trust me. I bought a scale and said 237 on it yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's not good. I would like to lose weight. I then went out and read my morning literature. It's called the Fatkins Diet Book. Mm -hmm. It says low protein, you know, this is the way the ancients ate. And then I walked by the fridge and I opened it up and there's only one cheesecake left. It's going to go bad. <laughs> <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> and my brother, my little brother Mike, goes to say, what drives him nuts? The lady comes in, the, with a 787-pound lady, comes to the drive-thru. Mm -hmm. I'll have three Big Macs. Mm -hmm. I have four large fries and a Diet Pepsi. <laughs> said, what's up with a Diet Pepsi? I'm trying to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Why do they get the Diet Pepsi? Because it makes you feel good. Because I got a Diet I'm, I'm buying Brian Diet Pepsi. Can you make it the big... You know, I got the big 5,000 ounce of Diet Pepsi because I'm trying to lose weight. <laughs> so you always do something as a token. The I would like class, he doesn't do absolutely nothing. It's part of the re how he succeeds in deceiving himself. And why until death... He never takes the means. He's intelligent in his self-deception. He doesn't repent, he doesn't change because of his manner of self-deception. It's a very, very serious price. It's why there aren't saints amongst the good men. Because we all are valetas, valeity. I would like, I would like to lose weight. So, does he do nothing? No. I remember one, one guy on retreat, back in Phoenix, UPS driver, the retreat house. Did you know why they made those machines, Father? With what? They made those Nordic tracks and those jazzercise machines so that UPS drivers could get exercise. 
because everybody that orders them, they always weigh six million pounds, and they're always on the 24th floor of some building, and I gotta carry them up the staircase. Always. And every time I'm carrying up this machine, <laughs> and then I get, it, I get into the room, open it up, and this lady, can you put it over there? And the only exercise they get is when they put their cup on the cup holder. And it might be used once. Some places I go to the place, and they could open up a gym. They got the entire basement with the Nordic track, with the jazzercise machine, with the ab machine, with every other machine, and every one of them is in pristine condition because they've all been used once. So they're doing something, and they make themselves believe they're doing something. What are they doing? They're changing and changing and changing. They're not actually doing anything. They bought all the diet books. They bought all the machines. They made all the New Year's resolutions. But when they walk by that fridge, it's going bad. Why do I have a weight problem? Well, because of my metabolism. It's a metabolism. You know. That's the problem. It's a metabolism. Maybe it has something to do with eating like a pig. <laughs> we have to study this. We have to go. We have to take it to the uh, to the experts in medicine. And it might be that if you don't eat like a pig, you might lose weight. You never see that in one of the diet books. Stop eating like a pig. Okay, it doesn't have to be a very long book. But the fact is that the uh, we we have this problem, and. We all believe there's something else that's the cause. Something else is the cause. I would like. This is the problem of attachments. The most common case, and we mention it here, even though it's not the point of this meditation, but always often mention it because it's, it's the most common case of I would like, has to do with anger. When it comes to the sin of anger, we always would like to solve the problem of anger, but we never take actual steps to overcome anger. Not the point of this meditation, but it's a very good example of what velleity is in the spiritual life. That we we want the anger to go away. Now, what is what does what does the diet man want? What is his real desire? Well, he wants the perfect diet. What is the perfect diet? Well, it's a magic pill that science could perhaps invent one day that tastes really really good, and you take it once or twice a year. Every day will be too too difficult, too much. So you take this once or twice a year, and this pill makes all food taste better, makes it able for you to eat more than you've ate before, and you lose weight. That's the ideal diet pill. And scientifically, it's possible to create such a thing. X-lax works pretty good. So some kind of an advanced form of X-lax. So that will somehow make you stronger, somehow make you eat more, and somehow make you lose weight. Such a pill may be invented. But here's the mystery of man. There's something about man that even if such a pill is invented, there will be millions of souls that won't take it. It will be too much for them. Medicine is supposed to taste bad, and this tastes good. I can't, I can't do that. Medicine is supposed to taste bad. Every year, you've got to be kidding. It doesn't matter how easy you make things, there will be souls who will reject it. It's the mystery of the free will of man. It just doesn't matter. In fact, the easier you make things, the more people reject it. This is one of the experiences. Remember when I was a kid here? One of the old farmers down the road. It wasn't Elmer the neighbor with another neighbor. He said, you know, when I was a kid, where was Elmer? down the road. You know, we used to drive, those young man we used to drive those Model T's, you know. And back in the days of the Model T and the Dodge, whatever it is, and we played in the early 1900s, when we would drive this thing around, they never had any blankers. Because mm -hmm. you know that whenever we would make a right turn, and this is including in a rainstorm on a dirt road with only a couple of uh, I would call it possums and deer watching. You stick your arm out the window, right, left, stop. <laughs> Said we never, never, we never, never, right, left, stop, left, right, stop. We never, we never, never didn't do that. 
always. So you're going to take a left turn, right turn, stop. Mm -hmm. We always did it. If it was raining, you roll down the window. Mm -hmm. And the snow and ice come through the window. And you stick your arm out make a left turn signal when there's nobody there. And a left turn, and right turn, and the right turn, and stop. Because you know, they, then they come out with blankers. Mm -hmm. When they come out with blankers, all you got to do is... And nobody does it. Nobody. I don't even do it. When there weren't blinkers, I rolled the window down. You know? And I'm shifting gears, stirring with my knees, rolling the window down, and... Then they come with blinkers. Are you kidding? I'm not going to go... Forget it. Nobody uses them. And he said, he said, it just goes to show you, the easier you make things, the less people do it. An old farmer told me that when I was a kid. The easier that you make things, the less they do it. Easier doesn't work. This Vilaitas class has got a very serious problem. It wants the problem to just go away on its own. Without any effort on our part. Because every problem affecting the will of man requires some effort on our part, we never, ever improve. The problem of the first class. They just want the problem to go away. They want the problem, they want the attachment to go away on its own. It won't happen. Again, the greatest heresy of our time, evolution, helps foster this. Because evolution teaches that over time things are just going to get better. That's something that appeals to us. If I just wait long enough, the problem will go away. Thereby, I don't have to make any changes in my decision making, in my virtue, in my life. The second class, I want, but on condition. That's the problem of the second class. I want to break the attachment, so that's good. I want means yes. So you see that the, we look at the first class, the, the first class says no, not now. Second class says yes, but on condition. Yes, but on condition. The trouble is the condition. The rule of condition. If the condition is the only reason for doing a good act, the good act becomes a mortal sin. If the condition is the only reason. So the example, always the same example. One of the little, I guess it's a kind of a version of Aesop's fables. See, once upon a time there was this little bitty birdie. His mommy went off to get him his supper and she was gone for a long time. And the little birdie wanted to see what the wide world looked like. And so he was in his nest, and he reached over the edge of the nest, he looked down, and he saw the ground. And that was interesting. And he leaned over more, and he saw the very branch of the tree. And then he saw, looked and leaned over more, and he saw the very bark of the, uh, of the, of the main part of the tree. But the birdie had leaned too far out of the nest. So he fell out of the nest, and plop, he landed on the cold ground. And the birdie wasn't happy. So the birdie stood up on the ground and went, chirp, 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 and along came a cow. And the cow looked down with her big brown eyes, and she saw the birdie was all cold, and she felt sorry for the birdie. So the cow turned around and lifted her tail, and plop, the birdie wasn't cold anymore. But the birdie still wasn't happy. And so the birdie stuck his head out of that cow pie, and he went, chirp, 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 chirp. And along came a fox. <laughs> and the fox saw how dirty that cow, that birdie was in that cow pie. So he pulled the birdie out of the cow pie, and he cleaned the birdie all out nice and neat, and then <clears throat> ate the birdie. <laughs> now my daddy tells me there's a moral of the story, but you've got to figure out for yourself. <laughs> but the moral is this. Number one, Whoever dumps on you is not necessarily trying to hurt you. <laughs> Number two, whoever pulls you out of a pile of crap is not necessarily trying to help you. <laughs> and most importantly, when you're up to your neck and crap, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> now, 
What is it that the fox did? He's the example of a mortal sin. The fox saw a birdie in a cow pie. The fox saw the birdie was unhappy because the birdie was dirty. The fox gently pulled the birdie out of the cow pie. That's nice. He cleaned the birdie off nice and proper. That's also nice. And then he ate the birdie. That's not nice. Why did he pull the birdie out of the cow pie? Because it was time for breakfast. Why did he clean the birdie off? Because it was time for breakfast. Therefore, the act of calling the birdie out of the cow pie was a mortal sin. The act of cleaning off the birdie was a mortal sin. This is the example of the charlatan. The charlatan does many good acts. Helps old ladies, helps them with their finances, uh, helps take care of them, super nice and gentle with them. And every single good act is a separate mortal sin. Why? Because the purpose of the act is to steal. Now, this kind of condition is actually rare, but it must be mentioned because to do a good act only because of some condition is mortal sin. However, normally it's mixed. Half good, half bad, like a scale. You might be doing it 75% of the reason might be the condition, 25% might be you're trying to be good. Or it might be 75% of the reason is that you want to be good and 25% is the condition. But the thing is that in order to be a saint, it's 100% to be good. And no condition. Conditions drag us down. St. Thomas Aquinas says that we are like birds or eagles who are most powerful and we want to fly to heaven. But a little string, the same eagle that can dive from the heavens, dive into the water and grab a large fish and pull him out of the water into the sky. That same eagle, when he's standing on the ground, you tie a little bitty thread around his leg and he cannot take off. If he's flying, he can grab a large animal and carry him into the air. But if he's on the ground, he cannot lift off with even a little rope. This is what happens with our attachments, says St. Thomas Aquinas. We have to cut them because it, they prevent us from being able to fly. And then, so these conditions, they are very dangerous. And he also says that it's like the bird. The bird has one act, the act of climbing. But as the bird is flying up, occasionally the bird looks back and discovers that the ground is further away. He's only climbing but he discovers the ground is further away. So likewise, we must break our attachments because we're going to God. And we're actually just going to God. But as we go to God, we look back and discover that we're further from the earth. Therefore, the breaking of conditions and the breaking of attachments is a necessary thing for anyone who wants to follow God. So we have these conditions. They must be broken. The problem of the second class is that we read here, but the, they want to free themselves of the attachment, but they wish to do so in such a way as to retain what they have acquired. They thus want God to come to what they desire, and they do not resolve to give up the money in order to go to God, and even though this would be the better state for them. The condition doesn't matter what it is. The condition can be, I must keep the money. The condition can be, under no circumstances will I keep the money. Either way, it's the same problem. What we want to do is, what God wants. And one of the questions of this particular meditation is, what are our conditions? What are the things that we are, that are holding us back in the supernatural life? We have to find out what they are, and try to combat against them. So, what are the conditions? In any case, the, uh, the trouble of the second class, they have a condition that holds them back. What is it that holds us back? If we had a survivor edition of the retreat, in, in which the holiest, most spiritual retreatant won a million dollars to give to the poor, we would have no distractions on the retreat. We would have no breaking of the silence we would have perfectly supernatural souls here on the retreat. 
We can actually do amazing things under the right conditions. Man puts a gun to your head, and you discover there are things you can do that you or you did ever knew you could. See, Maximilian Kolbe describes the beginning of the, the arrival in the German prison camp. The commandant said, you will hold a stick at the end of your arm, and if you drop your arm, you will, you will be shot. He saw the weakest, oldest man without a single muscle. Never drop the stick. He was stronger than he thought. We sometimes think that we don't have the strength, but if you don't have the strength, you don't have the strength. It doesn't matter. If you're paralyzed and you want to run, you can't run. But we think we're paralyzed. A bishop team is the example of the, um, the California, the San Francisco earthquake in 1905 that there was a home for the paralyzed. Had people that hadn't walked in 30 years, 30 people got up and walked. <laughs> people that had not walked for 30 years, when that earthquake happened and the building that they were in started to fall down, they walked. So that they didn't think they could walk, but when the building was coming down, they did. The ones that are truly paralyzed, they can't walk no matter how much they want to. We often think we're paralyzed when we're not. So we have to break these conditions for the second class. The goal is to arrive at the third class. This is called the Ignatian Indifference. It's the second time we deal with it. The call of Christ the King, we dealt with it a little bit. They wish to free themselves of the attachment, but in such a way that their inclination will be neither to retain the thing acquired nor not to retain it, Desiring to act only as God our Lord shall inspire them, and as it shall seem better to them for the service and praise of His Divine Majesty. Meanwhile, they wish to consider that they have in their hearts broken all attachments, for striving not to desire that thing or anything else, unless it be the will of God. Sometimes God will say, keep the money. Sometimes He will say, get rid of the money. More often, it's going to say, get rid of it, because it's so dangerous for us. But sometimes He'll say, keep it, rather than get rid of it. We want to do whatever he wants, not anything else. So if you're going to eat fish on Friday, fine. You're going to eat meat on Saturday, fine. You're going to have no, no candy during Lent, fine. You're going to have candy on Easter, fine. Why? According to as God wishes. So we have this as the Ignatian indifference. Ignatian indifference. We want only what God wants. Now this indifference can often be misunderstood doesn't mean you have no desires. Because the same God that commands us to want what He wants, He wants us to have firm desires. God appeared to Daniel through an angel, and the angel said, Behold, the man of God, the man of great desires. The man of great desires. Same, I think, is the said of St. John the Apostle. The man of great desires. God liked Daniel because it was great desires. David, great desires. We have to have great desires. We cannot be apathetic. This is a misunderstanding of indifference. Indifference does not mean I don't care. That's a sin of indifference. Whether it be the sin of indifference by which we have religious indifference, we don't care what religion we belong to, or the sin of indifference in which we don't care about morality. You want to kill them? Fine. You want to kill them? Fine. I don't care. I'm indifferent. So, indifference in that type, in all its forms, is a sin. God made us creatures of free will who are supposed to have firm desires. That is why our Lord said, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock with importunity. Don't stop knocking. St. Teresa of the child Jesus wanted to be a Carmelite. And if she was not a saint, I want to be a Carmelite. I don't want to wait till I'm 16. I want to be a Carmelite now. So she goes and asks, can I get a Carmel? No, you must wait. Okay. When can I come? She didn't do that. She didn't say okay. She said, no, I want to be a Carmelite. And then she went to Bishop. And then she had to go to the Pope. And so she went to Rome to see the Pope. She would not be held back. She had a firm desire. 
And God wants us to have firm desires. This is not Ignatian indifference. Ignatian indifference is indifference by which we want to have firm desires, where these desires will be in accord with the divine love, in accord with the divine glory. We can expect obstacles on the path to heaven. It was found in the lives of the saints. It must be found in our lives also. We must have firm desires, not a false indifference. Man was not made for this indifference. We're not indifferent to things that are important to us. Indifference means to want only what God wants. When He decides that He doesn't want us to, to, to do this work, then we stop it. Go to another work? Fine. But we have firm desires to do a work. And when we discover that God doesn't want us to build this house, God doesn't want us to be in this place, then fine. We go to another place. We build another house. So, I want as the third condition without conditions. This is dangerous because, I mean, this is important, but to understand it, I have to go to these examples of sacred scripture and then send you to the meditation. How do we tell the difference between firm desire with conditions and firm desire without conditions? What is it that we want? What happens in our hearts? Try to find an example here. We know that we're running out of electricity and we need electricity and all the power plants are old in America and they're going down and what's going to solve the problem is a nuclear power plant. So we want a nuclear power plant and we vote for a nuclear power plant. We need a nuclear power plant. It's going to bring jobs. It's, it's going to stabilize our electricity problem. We really want a nuclear power plant. It's important. We need this. And there's people that are against it, which is just crazy. Turns out that uh, Mr. Jones is against it because they're going to put it in the far eastern part of the county right next to his house. He's got to realize that, look, the county needs it. The next day, they come in and say, you know what, they're going to put the power plant in your backyard. Mm -hmm. You know what, we don't need a power plant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculous. We've been doing fine with this other stuff for the last 20, 30, 40 years. My lights work. I don't get the problem. This is ridiculous. I'm going to start a campaign against the power plant. So, I firmly want this power plant. What's the reason why I want it? Maybe it's for my own convenience. I firmly want this power plant. What's the reason why I want it? Maybe it's for the common good. If it's for the common good and it must be in my backyard, let's put it in my backyard. See, Frank and Jesse James were just farmers, you see. And it turned out that they were building a railroad. They weren't against the railroad. They were just against the railroad going through their farm. Why can't they take the railroad and make it go 200 miles north, and then 100 miles over this way, and then 200 miles south again, so it doesn't go through my farm? I don't see the problem. Nobody's going to mind an extra one-day trip going from, Virginia, from Washington, D.C. to the west. I mean, come on! We have a case like that in Colorado. I remember driving up I-25. You go down up I-25, the, the, from Denver to Fort Collins, and around Longmont, there's a Longmont bend where the, 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 and I-25 goes up, and it comes down this long hill, and goes up the other one. But if you go down this hill, you'll see that it goes down, and then it turns and goes around a farmhouse, which has been empty now for about 60, for about 40 years been there for maybe a hundred years. The guy who owned it said, I ain't selling. Mm -hmm. And he was fighting against I-25 when it was built. And so they built the road all the way around it. Then he died. Now nobody lives there. And it's just a rotted house with a tree. And so now you drive I-25. <laughs> nice tree. <laughs> and so, now, the fact is that 
Does the common good matter? Does the city have the right to expand the road and take out your front porch? And the answer is yes, they do. If we understand the common good is greater than the particular good, then if we realize the common good needs the road to be expanded and my front yard to be contracted, we should help them expand the road. Of course, they should pay us some, they should pay some, um, the city should pay for the, the, the land that they're taking. And what do they do about that? How do they do that? They built a six billion dollar airport in Denver, Colorado. What did the old uh, Pena do? They got the beautiful road named after him. He went into worthless farmland in the middle of Colorado and he bought it for nothing. It just happens to be the place where they're going to put the future airport. Then the government says, we're going to build an airport. He says, you know what, i got some dirt here worth about $500,000 a square inch. <laughs> You're right, I agree. And so they paid like a billion dollars for the farmland. <laughs> and it got split up. And there were a lot of happy people. <laughs> Very often, we have a firm will to do things, but what's the reason? The saint has a firm will, and you get in his way, he's going to run you over. <laughs> but what's the reason for his firm will? His firm will is for the greater glory of God, the salvation of souls, the spread of the kingdom of Christ. He doesn't have this false indifference that we often hear even some priests speak about, whatever God wants. When it comes to buying furniture for the rectory, <laughs> Right? It's got to be that leather couch. <laughs> you see, when it comes to buying furniture for the rectory, oh, it matters. But when it comes to the things of God, you know, look, don't be uptight about it. That is not a virtue, that is a vice. We don't have a firm will. And if we did, we could enter into this third class. But the firm will is based on love. And what do we love? God, salvation of souls, glory of, glory of the church, the truth. What do we love? That love should not allow us to tolerate those things that are against that love. And so, you have the case in the Old Testament, I forget the name of the judge, his wife was cheating on him. And so he killed his wife and the man that he was committed adultery with with one sword blow. And it says in the book of, I think it's the book of Judges, it was the zeal of God that made him do it. Now he wasn't a jealous husband because the cheating on the, his wife was cheating on him. It was the fact that they were offending God. It was the love of God and the zeal for God that made him take the sword and with such power he killed them in one blow while they were in the act of sin. So, he had a firm will. But what is that firm will related to? In this third condition, I mean this third uh, the, the class, I want what God wants. I want His glory. I want His kingdom to be spread. And I don't care about any conditions for myself. That's why St. Ignatius says, we must be profit profitless servants. We do not need an income. We do not need uh, the, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, support. That's why the two, class, the, three class, the, the two standard meditation was made first. Because we want to get to this third class. That we don't care about the pay. We don't care about the income. We don't care about the, the what's in it for me. Many priests in the last two years speaking with them. I want to stand up against Bishop Fillet. I want to stand up against the modernism in the society. I don't like it. But where's my rectory? Where's my parish? How am I going to survive? And so they don't stand up. And I remember when I was a kid, and I remember hearing this in the last two years. In the 1970s, more than 100 priests passed through here in that house over there. And Father Hannafin lived over here in a little trailer. And they come and see Father Hannafin. 
And I remember those priests in the 1970s. <coughs> you know, Frank, I, I, I want to say the Latin Mass. I, I want to stand with the truth, but how am I going to survive? What about my pension? What about my health insurance? Where am I going to live? How am I going to survive? How am I going to survive? How am I going to survive? I've heard that so many times when I was a kid. And I was reminded of it the last two years. Speaking to priests in this present crisis. The same words that those priests spoke in the 70s. I now hear from priests in the last two and a half years. Two years. We're all human beings. And we do need support. That's why the reason why it's important that we do the work that we're doing. We do want to provide a house for priests. We do want to provide a parish for priests. But the trouble is, are we ready to go without any guarantees? That's what God wants. Examples from sacred scripture. The second class. This is the class of Naaman. Naaman is a it's, it's, it's uh, Naaman, remember the leper, the Syrian, the general of the Syrian army, was found with leprosy. He's a Jewish slave girl in his uh, court, in the court of the king. The king was unhappy and weeping, and Naaman, of course, was weeping. The Jewish slave girl said, send Naaman to my country, Israel, for there is a great prophet there, and he can cure Naaman of his leprosy. So they were encouraged. And they sent Naaman with a lot of money, you know, gifts and talents and so on, over to Israel. Eventually, goes to Elizaeus, the prophet. And Elizaeus doesn't have time to see Naaman. He knows he's coming to be cured of his uh, leprosy. He sends his servant, G.H.C., to Naaman, and he says, Naaman, I know you want to be cured of your leprosy. My master, Elizaeus, doesn't have time to see you. He says, if you want to be cured, go down to the River Jordan, wash seven times, <coughs> and you will be cured. So Naaman became very angry. And he said, I did not come here to have a servant tell me to go take a bath. I came here to stand in front of the great prophet, to hear him call down in a special prayer the power of God, to lay his hand upon me and cure me of my leprosy. I did not come here to have a servant boy tell me to take a bath. He was very angry. <coughs> and so he left. As he was leaving, going back towards Syria, his servants began to speak to him. And they said, uh, Naaman, what would you do if the prophet asked you to do a great and difficult thing? I would do it. I would do it. I would do it. He only asked you to take a bath. <laughs> and he realized his foolishness. Now the point of the condition, Naaman was willing to wage a war. He was a soldier. He was willing to do all kinds of difficult things. But he wasn't willing to humble himself and take a bath. Why these seven washings? The fathers of the church tell us the seven sacraments. So many souls go to hell simply because they won't accept those sacraments. They would accept other things, doing great penances, climbing mountains, whatever. Many difficult things they would accept, but they won't accept those sacraments. They also won't accept the seven virtues, which are also very easy. Faith, hope, charity, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitudes. They also won't accept the seven uh, <clears throat> corporal works of mercy and the seven spiritual works of mercy, all of which are easy. But many, many souls will go to hell and reject God because they don't accept these conditions. Though they would accept other ones. So, they, so Naaman exits the second class and enters the third when he gives up his foolish condition. Which is just simply based on his own pride. And then he goes and washes seven times in the Jordan and he is cleansed of his uh, leprosy. And the final example, the first... Uh, condition. I mean the first class, which is the rich young man, and the most common example of the average mediocre Catholic. Not a bad man. The rich young man. Remember the story of the rich young man? <clears throat> he feels there's something missing in his life. He goes to Christ, asks him, Master, I feel as though there's something lacking in me. 
Christ tells them, go sell all you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. He doesn't want to do that. He leaves very sad because he was rich. Now, the first obvious question about that whole story, why put yourself in that situation? Why go to Christ when if he tells you something and you're not willing to do it, you're going to be in a worse state than if you just left it alone? Why does he do that? And also, why is he unhappy? Remember when the rich young man goes and meets Christ, our Lord asks him the normal priestly questions. Are you obeying the Ten Commandments? Yes. <coughs> Are you giving to the poor? Yes. What was he supposed to say? Because when the rich young man rehearsed the conversation in his mind, he is not as proud as the Pharisees, but he has pride. He's weak. He is not a brood of vipers. He is not like the Pharisees. But he's a little bit proud. He wants to speak to Christ. He'd like to speak to him alone. But he can't because our Lord is very popular. So he can't speak to him alone. So he is going to speak to him in public because there's no other choice. He's going to, Lord, I feel as though there's something lacking in me. And the Lord says, well, are you obeying the commandments? Yes. Are you giving to the poor? Yes. There's nothing lacking in you. Keep doing what you're doing. That's what we want to hear. This is that's what good spiritual advice is. What's good spiritual advice? Keep doing what you're doing. Remember telling the story frequently of uh, Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn made a vow when he was a little kid, a movie actor in the 1930s and 40s, and the vow was that he would rather die than work a day in his life. He fulfilled his vow. So the Depression came in the 1930s, and he was hungry like everybody else. And he didn't want to work, so he figured, I'll just go to South America. They're not having a depression down there, so he went to South America. He found out that you still need to work down there. He didn't like that either, so he was really starving. He said, i got to do something. And he saw a job opening that said, Plantation Director. He says, I can't work, but I think I can direct. Mm. So he went in, and he says, um, I'm a Plantation Director from America. I came down here to see all the plantations, and I'm, I can take the job. He didn't know anything about trees. He knew nothing about plants. He knew nothing. Mm. And they said, you know about, oh yeah, I know, you name it, I know it, yeah, no problem. He says, okay, why don't you go and direct the plantation? So he went out to the guys planting fruit trees, they're planting orange trees, they're planting whatever, bananas or whatever. He says, what are you doing? He goes, I'm planting bananas. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> then he went to the next guy, he said, what are you doing? And he goes, well, what we're doing is keep doing what you're doing. You know what they said? He's the best plantation director they ever had. They said, nobody knows crops like this guy. He's incredible. The guy's awesome. He was the best director they ever had. Did he ever learn anything about it? Are you kidding? Absolutely not. He got enough money, he then went to Hollywood. And then became an actor. Keep doing what you're doing. That's what you're supposed to happen. Father, how am I doing? You're doing fine. Thank you, Father. <laughs> That's all we want to hear. It's true that we do need to be encouraged sometimes. It's true. But what happens in the Gospel? Our Lord says, or it says in the Gospel, He was filled with an exceeding great love for that rich young man. And therefore He said to him, Go sell all you have, give to the poor, and come follow Me. He's being asked to be the 13th Apostle. Who would be that 13th Apostle? St. Paul. Did he change his mind and not have a 13th Apostle? No, he still did. Just that he was born out of due time. He would have been the Apostle of the Gentiles. He would have been the one that wrote those 14 epistles. We don't even know his name. And the fathers of the church tell us that when that rich young man said no to Christ and walked away sad, he did not commit a sin. Because he was not being obliged under pain of sin to follow him but because he made this choice, it will be very difficult for him to save the soul. So one of the points of this meditation is how seriously bad it is to remain in this first class. How tragic it is. Look how empty of a life that rich young man would live. We don't even know his name. He lived an empty life. He died an empty death. He is forgotten. But St. Paul the greatest of the apostles of the Gentiles. Sometimes, when we say no 
to a request. If only we knew the joy and the glory and the wonder and the happiness that would have happened had we said yes, we would not be so foolish as to say no. It's like the example Bishop Sheen says, man came back from the races. And he said, darn, what? I won $100. So what's the problem? Says, well, I originally bet one hundred dollars on this horse that was a hundred to one odds, and right before the race, I didn't want to lose hundred bucks, so I pulled out ninety nine dollars and I bet one dollar, and my horse won. Right before the race, instead of winning a hundred thousand dollars, I got a hundred dollars, which is the exact amount of money that I brought with me. <laughs> I didn't want to take too big of a chance. And right before the race, I pulled out my $100 bet and put down only a $1 bet, and then my horse won. And it happens so often that we don't get the dividends, we don't get the returns, we don't get the joy, we don't get the excitement, we don't get the wonderful life that we should have, simply because we didn't put enough down. And this is the problem of the first class. And we have the problem of conditions, the problem of the second class. And I'll see the meditation here. But, go ahead and tell the, the, uh, the final story. That we, that Father Tim, the days in the retreat, Kentucky story. The example of the second class. Father Lafitte used to tell the example here of the white rabbit. <clears throat> Little Johnny was too attached to his white rabbit. But here another one. <clears throat> Same point. What are our attachments? What are we to attach to? What's holding us back is the question. <clears throat> and here it's a story of the Kentucky story here of Elijah. Elijah was out hunting one day here in the knobs of Kentucky in this area. We have really thick foliage and hills and sudden cliffs sometimes. He was out hunting for possum, and, out, and uh, it was getting evening, getting late, and he was going to return home. He normally goes around a certain knob, but this particular day he realized it was getting late, so he decided to take a shortcut over an unfamiliar knob. These little mountain-like things here in Kentucky we call knobs. They look like little mountains, come to a point. And very often these knobs have cliffs on them. But the, what, what happens is, because of the very thick foliage, the grass and the bushes grow over the cliff. So when you're walking, you don't see the cliff until one day you put your foot, and then there's no ground there. And you fall. And that's what happened to Elijah as he was on his way back home. Over this unfamiliar knob, he was cutting through the woods. He stepped in one of those, there was no ground. He fell. As he was falling down this cliff, there was a branch. He grabbed onto the branch and he held onto the branch. He looks up, perfectly smooth cliff going up the top. He looks down, the black abyss. He's in the middle of nowhere, we got a problem. So Elijah says, Dad, Tom, oh, Apple, Dad, help, 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 help. Nobody comes. He's in the middle of nowhere. Finally, after a long time, he says, Lord, Lord, please help me. Well, you know, the Lord hadn't heard from Elijah for a powerful long time. So, you know, I'm hearing from Elijah. It's just good to hear from him. I'm going to go down and see how he's doing. So the Lord came down to the edge of the cliff and says, Elijah, it's just good to hear from you. How are you doing? Elijah says, Lord, I know I ain't been to church. I know I ain't been good, but I'll do anything you want me to do. You just get me out of this here fix, and I'll do anything you want me to do. You do anything, Elijah, I'll do anything, Lord. You really want to get out of the fix? I do, Lord. Let go of the branch. <laughs> Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> and he called for help again and again. And somehow three times during the night, he called to the Lord. Lord came over to talk to him. Told him to let go of the branch. And somehow, miraculously, he was able to hold on to that branch all the way until the morning. And when the sun rose, he found out he was this high off the ground. Now, what's the trouble with that branch? And it's the trouble of conditions. You know, the average wood, uh, you know, forest, woods, has a whole lot of branches in it. What was so special about that particular branch? And look at all the pain that he experienced. Not only the physical pain of hanging in the arms and the neck of the night, hanging all night on that branch, but the, but the worry and the stress and the fear and the terror. All those things he experienced because he was attached 
to a branch. And this is exactly what happens to our souls as a result of these attachments. It's what ruined the life of the rich young man. And it's what ruins the life of, of what could have ruined the life of Naaman. And we have to ask that question, what am I too attached to in this meditation? What is holding me back? And let's break the attachment. And remember this truth. If God asks something of us, <clears throat> we only fall into his hands. We cannot fall into anything bad or any place bad. He wants us to make acts of faith. Are we ready to make them? Our fathers made them. Our ancestors made them. All the saints made them. Are we ready to make them? Because we have the example of so many saints down these thousands of years, 6,000 years, from Adam until the most recent saints, we don't have any excuses for not making these answers to Christ. So we'll say to the meditation, and when you hear the bell, it'll be the end of the meditation and time to come in for the lunch. So at 12.42, uh, the end of the bell. And then we'll have the lunch. The lunch is at 12.45 today. Also, this afternoon is a busy afternoon with three conferences. But so this the but nonetheless, the when you hear the bell, we'll be at the end of the meditation and come in for lunch. So a double bell. The bell means in meditation and come in for lunch. So wait till you hear the bell. We'll see if we're Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost. Saint Vincent Ferrer, Saint Jude. Lady of Victory, Lady of Sorrows, Lady of Christians, Lady of Nations, Father, Son, Holy Ghost.